Councilor Perks, I'm, I'm going to count you as here for quorum, but I, we, I'm going to go through the housekeeping so you guys uh, keep on there. Uh, welcome to uh, this afternoon's meeting. I'm calling the meeting to order because I have Councilor Perks here. Councilor Moise will be here any second. We were a little late getting out of the morning session. Um, and so, oh, here he is. Okay. So, uh, today's meeting is being held in person at City Hall in Committee Room 1. Members of the public who are registered to speak are participating by video conference on WebEx and are also, uh, some of us are in the room. This meeting is also being live streamed and you can find the link to that live stream on toronto.ca forward slash council. Uh, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? There's none here and I don't think that will change for Councillor Moise in the afternoon. So seeing none, we'll proceed. This is a meeting of, this, of a subcommittee of the Budget Committee. Councillor Perks, Councillor Moise and myself are members of one of two subcommittees that have been established to hear deputations today. Our colleagues, Deputy Mayor McKelvey, uh, Deputy Mayor Amber Morley and Councillor Lily Chang are meeting at Scarborough Civic Centre which starts, uh, has started uh, at 1.30 this afternoon. And then again, between six and nine, both of us will be hearing deputations, both locations. City Clerk has posted the speakers list online. You go to these meetings under toronto.ca forward slash council and click on the speakers button under today's entry in the, the uh, meeting schedule. You will uh, find the list and where you are on it. I'll, I'll be calling the names two or three at a time so people have a little bit of warning as well. We have approximately 90 speakers signed up to speak at our three meetings today at City Hall plus another 60 registered to speak later at Scarborough Civic Centre. So I want to thank everyone who registered to speak to the Budget Committee overall. For those who tried to register to speak but could not, either because the sessions were full or the deadline to register had passed, please email your thoughts on the budget to buc at toronto.ca. The City Clerk makes your emails and letters available to all members of Council and then I nag each and every one to read them. And we receive your emails and we appreciate you taking the time to participate in the budget process. We're doing our best to uh, provide as many opportunities for that as possible. For those who are speaking today, here's our speaker's process. We have speakers in person and online. If you're online, the video conference host will activate your microphone and you can turn on your video while you make your deputation if you like. I'll be calling each name on the list in order and then you'll have five minutes to speak to the budget committee. After you speak, please stay in your seat or if you're uh, video conferencing, stay on the line because members of committee may want to ask questions. After your speaking time, you can stay connected and listen or follow the rest of the meeting on YouTube. Here we are. The, the clerk has received emails and communications from the public about the 2024 budget. Um, written communications already. Several, in fact. Those communications are being made available to members on the clerk's meeting portal, so they're already receiving. And I encourage the public to send their comments to the Budget Committee through that same process, buc at toronto.ca. This is the public's opportunity to speak about the budget. And it's also our opportunity to consider your comments and input before we make our recommendations. Budget Committee will meet again after hearing in all of these locations on January 26th for our wrap-up meeting our final wrap-up, and we will at that time make our recommendations to the Mayor and to City Council. So that being said, we're going to prepare and uh, start uh, start the list. Did you do, oh, Matthew, did me a printout? Thank you very much. Um, so uh, as I've already said, uh, I'll be calling up two or three at a time, so you're warned, and then uh, and then you'll, you'll have five minutes in the chair here. You just press your... Uh, Press the button uh, beside your microphone. So um, I have Sue Mi Chang from uh, Street Haven, uh, then Roberta Taylor and Robert Condren. Is Sue uh, here? Yes, she is. Okay. Welcome. I'll wait till you're seated to, to start your clock. Okay. You have five minutes to speak. Go ahead. Greetings, Budget Subcommittee. I want to start this deputation by stating very firmly that shelters are an essential service. 
Although the memory of the pandemic is fading, we must not forget the role that shelters played in keeping the homeless safe, fed, and healthy, and diverting demand away from emergency services and hospitals, and freeing them up to care for those who needed it. Serendipitously, today is the start of Emergency Shelter and Homeless Service Worker Appreciation Week. It's a week that we set aside to express our gratitude for the contributions of our shelter workers. I'm here to endorse investments in shelter services as set out in the proposed budget. Street Haven is an award-winning multi-service women's agency that has the distinction of having established Canada's first women's shelter in 1968 when our founder, emergency room nurse Peggy Ann Walpole, noticed that vulnerable and home housing insecure women were being ignored by the social welfare system. Fast forward nearly 60 years, the marginalization of vulnerable women has worsened and the homeless, refugee and housing affordability crises are intersecting in women's shelters. Street Haven's base shelter and shelter hotel programs have been operating at capacity for years, and we've seen demand for our services dramatically rise because of the homeless refugee crisis playing out in the streets of Toronto. We've turned away over 700 refugees and claimants at our shelter door since mid-June, and that exceeded the total number of women we served last year. Clearly, demand for shelter services is exceeding current capacity. Ignoring the upcoming proposed budget investments in shelter services to meet this demand is a social justice issue. Street Haven and other shelters play an important public service role in Toronto. Our role ensures that homeless women, often with mental health and trauma challenges, are kept off the streets and supported with social care supports and mental health supports through our partnerships with healthcare agencies whom we've integrated our services. All our shelter clients have access to a psychiatrist and a doctor on site because of this. Their mental health needs are being addressed rather than being neglected. We've diverted the use of Toronto's policing and emergency services. We are managing mental health crises in our shelters and we're bearing this huge burden using a trauma-informed lens that humanizes their challenges rather than problematizes them. Most of the refugees and claimants who are in our shelters have fled their homes because of gender-based violence. In addition to the existing and new investments proposed in the shelters, we request that at least a third be dedicated to women's only shelter services. Shelter using women have unique needs and experiences that are gender based. As mentioned, these women are survivors of GBV and other forms of intimate partner violence. There is significant trauma associated with our clients. As a result, the concerns and the sense of safety whom phys from physical, sexual, and psychological violence are crucial to why they need a women's only shelter bed. The emotional support from staff and from other shelter clients is an aspect of the benefits of women's only shelters. Women's only shelters provide vital time and supports for women to consider personal goals that are necessary to make that first steps towards greater independence and feelings of control. This includes family reunification, the legal system, education, employment, immigration, income security, and housing insecurity, housing security. Women's shelters offer supports in helping shelter users to navigate the healthcare system and to make referrals in a respectful manner that ensures their privacy and gendered nature of healthcare and medical issues. Lastly, we ask that you consider increasing investments in housing stabilization programs like the one we operate, our Pathways to Independence program is keeping women at risk of losing their homes and preventing homelessness and diverts demand away from women's shelters. They do this through intensive case management and address complex issues, including hoarding, life skill challenges, and trauma, to name a few. We are delighted that our program has prevented over 30 women last year from becoming homeless in Toronto, thereby keeping them out of this shelter and off the streets. I would also request that continued investments and increased investments in Cobb also be considered, as that has actually been a vehicle to helping women in our shelters move out of our shelters and to be able to afford market rent, and therefore freeing up shelter beds so that more women can get off the streets and into our safe shelter beds. Thank you for your time and consideration. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thanks so much. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to ask you not to. I, I, I didn't want to interrupt the deputation, but you really can't take your pictures. You're at the committee table right now. So you're going to have to leave. Yeah. 
Sorry. Go stand on the other side of the room. Yeah, you just have to be on the other side of the room or over there behind. You can you can go behind the media desks, but the rest is set. Yeah. Uh, about 50 years ago. I'm not being silly. That's always been the rule. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm not going to argue about it. I've been here for 20 years, and that's the rule. Yeah. Sorry. Love you all a lot, but you can't be at the committee table. Where you go. You are, are you Robert? I'm Robert. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Hope you're gonna, you're gonna cover off on what, what she was talking about as well. Thank you so much for coming. Okay, go ahead, Robert. My name is Robert and I'm here as a representative of the Member Advocacy Committee of St. Stephen's Drop-In Centre in Kensington Market. I'd like to share with you part of my lived experience in Toronto in the last few years and I hope you take into consideration how this budget could affect people with similar stories to mine. I have a diagnosed mood disorder and I'm an alcoholic in recovery. I've owned a house, I have been homeless, but I currently live in stable housing. I've owned a business, I've had bouts of unemployment due to my mental health and addiction, and I currently have full-time employment at a treatment center. I owe a lot of this to the neighborhood group community services. It is there where I gained vital experience in the community as a peer support worker. An employment worker at the neighborhood group helped build my confidence, bulked up my experience and helped build my resume. This led me to getting my dream job that I'm currently employed at. The housing worker at TNG helped me find stable housing. Going from unhoused, sleeping on benches, sleeping on friends' couches in long stays at CAMH to aiding me to finding an apartment from being unhoused to being housed. However, in the last few years, due to previous council budget cuts, TNG lost all their employment workers and housing workers. Who does that? Who cuts housing workers for the unhoused? Who cuts work, um, workers, employment workers for those that are living in poverty, those that are unemployed. Some of our members are housed, but they often have landlords that aren't abiding by the, the landlord tenant uh, laws of Ontario. Housing workers provide vital support, informing our members of their rights and referring them to other agencies and paralegal teams that can help. Who cuts employment workers to those living in poverty, the unemployed? Employment workers can help guide and direct people's skills with, into employment. How have these cuts benefited our community? How have they benefited our society in general? I'm really grateful for these workers. They were there for me when I needed help getting through the obstacles of mental health and addiction. I don't know where I'd be, be, where I'd be without them. I can see a direct relation between these workers' involvements with me and how I my life got substantially more manageable. It's not unfortunate that people in similar situations have been given these opportunities. It's tragic. My grandfather used to say, give a man a fish and he can eat for a day. Give a man a rod and he won't go hungry. These workers were my rod. When you make budget decisions, I hope you realize that cuts to services that may seem insignificant can make a world of difference to people in our community. They made a difference in my life. So please take consider into consideration those who are vulnerable and hurting over those who are hoarding wealth and living in abundance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for the deputy? Seeing none, thank you so much. That was a, a very personal deputation. We really appreciate it. Okay, so I have, I'm going to go through a few names here. I have Brian Mirabelli, who I believe is a video participant. So while you're queuing him up, after him is Jessica Samuel and Rena Sangupta. So I will uh, start with Brian, who is on the line. Are you there yet, Brian? We see you online. Oh, there you are. You're unmuted now. Excellent. Hi, Brian. Uh, Councillor Carroll here. So you have uh, uh, five minutes to speak to us today. 
Thank you very much for, for your time there, Councillor. I, I don't have very much to say on on the matters of of the of the of the city budget in particular. Uh, my most my most concerning uh, aspect uh, for the city would be that um, the the challenges with the upcoming World Cup in the city of Toronto in the next um, next few years, and that uh, and the, and the housing shortage and housing crisis in the city of Toronto getting to a place where people like myself who live in a small apartment in the city of Toronto and uh, very very um, low income low income housing where I where I live with three other elderly people and the other people that I live with in the in the city it's very emotional for me because my grandmother who's over 90 years old she she's she's such an unbelievable force force of strength for the city of Toronto and my two parents who live with me also who are were unbelievable advocates for the city of Toronto and 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 housing support and and the ability for for the city of Toronto to actually perform at a level where where someone like myself can actually be part of the city still. I, I actually I recently completed my PhD in, in philosophy and psychology and my and my and my Yale Law School degree at um, recently was was completed in 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 in, in a few years uh, from the city of Toronto. So the, the connectivity between the city of Toronto and and the rest of the housing and the housing crisis in particular for the for the medical community is is of utmost most importance for me because without that connection to the to the homeless and the homeless shelters and the weak and, and disabled, we will have, we live in a city where we're not gonna be showing the best of our abilities. And I hope that we're able to enable those people who are citizens to, to, to showcase their love for not only Toronto, but their love for the world as, as we know it. So I know I have a few more minutes here, but I, I, have, I only had a few more words to say on, in, these, in these areas and most had to do with family and, and relationships and, and, and in particular, the ability for us to perform at a level where, where we can actually enable uh, in, in an organization like CPA Canada to, to allow for these 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 relationships to to be maintained, and and to and you can see that the challenge that I'm dealing with here because I've actually recently incurred a brain injury and a heart multiple heart injuries, and some of the challenges of living alone and living with the elderly after the pandemic, and and I and I and I'm, I'm sorry if you, I'm not as clear as I, I could have been in these environments, but I'm trying to enable this to um to to be to, to be still still be seen and heard within the city of Toronto in a way that that because I, I, I can sometimes I'm under under the, the, the place where people can still hear me or see me or understand me and, and, and so it's, it's, it can be a challenge to to be interpreted the right way and and so again my voice heard here today is very very important to, to to enable this this conversation to happen still and i hope that uh, i hope that my I, my time is is is, is, is still a few, few minutes here to enable this this conversation to happen um I hope that you that um the, my main the main concern i have here is the, is the, the the bitcoin and the concern for the bitcoin uh, and then the challenges with Bitcoin and, and what it means for a small business owner. I have a small business named Capture Insight Limited, which I started on my own here at, at 50 Vermont Avenue. And I started the, the business on my own in 2020. And, and what, I, what I really love about the, the ability for online interactions to exist in, in, in this environment is, is that my small corporation exists on LinkedIn enabled with, with LinkedIn AI and the ability for LinkedIn AI to actually um, enable the, 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 the little corporation I have on my own that I developed on my own in, in city of Toronto while I was a student to actually be enabled in a way that I can still earn an income regardless of my disabilities in the city of Toronto. So the main challenge that I have when I'm, when I'm trying to navigate the, the little corporation named Capture Insight Limited is that it's actually already enabled, it's already cloud enabled. It, was, it started um, very, very, as a very small idea here to, to attend online and virtual events um, at home and remotely while I was a student. And then the one thing it allows me to do still regardless of my disabilities is to be a part of community, a part of society where where I actually am still um, actively participating as a, as a business owner, using the skills I developed in school and, 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 and showcasing the best that the city of Toronto has to offer online and, and also reducing the risk from, from various employment and engagements from firms from, from PricewaterhouseCoopers to, to Deloitte, for example, and while reading and, 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 and interacting online around the world in a way that I wouldn't otherwise be able to, regardless of my disabilities. And so some of the challenges here for me, for example, is that, that sometimes with, with, the, with, the, with the way medicine is going right now, that there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uncertainty with with brain health and brain science, which I would hope that we can we can enable, and and that my little corporation can play a bigger part in, in in enabling brain health and brain science around the world, because I know that that the the some of the, the technology we have at UHN at from UHN to Trillium to Sinai Health Foundation are world leading medical institutions that are are really a vital part of the, the infrastructure for the city of Toronto. I need to continue to be a vital part of the, the infrastructure for the city of Toronto going forward, and without their without their capacity being understood around the world uh, as world leading hospitals, I think we might run into challenges in the future. So I know I have a couple of minutes here left, but I really want to thank the city council for all they've done to enable the, the relationship with the city of Toronto and old Toronto 
and New Toronto, wherever Toronto is going to go into the future, and the hospital system for, from Toronto to New York and back. And I thank you very much for, for my time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Are there any questions for the deputant? Uh, we don't have any questions, so thank you so much for your, your uh, uh, speech. Okay. Okay. Uh, next, I have uh, Jessica Samuel and then Rena Sengupta. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Okay. okay. You have five minutes. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee and city council at large for the opportunity to speak um, today. So as a person born and raised in the city, I've be grown up watching Toronto transform for the better, but in recent years for the worst. Um, it's been 25 years since amalgamation, and while the purpose of it may have been to unify the former municipalities into one Toronto by the provincial government at the time, it feels like there hasn't been much progression since. Um, and there are certain areas of Toronto that still aren't seen as part of the city, even though they are. So I live in North York, which is um, west of Yonge Street, in an area that's been overlooked in many facets. There are many issues when it comes to housing, transit, infrastructure, healthcare, but it becomes stark in comparison to other areas and became only more pronounced when the pand pandemic began in 2020. For example, I've seen how this has played out when it's come to public transit. Um, the Toronto Star recently reviewed how many delays TTC riders have experienced for the year of 2023. And when it came to bus service, one of the routes in my neighborhood was in the top five for the, one of the most delayed routes citywide. I've personally witnessed this, how this has um, unfolded during rush hour with dozens of people packed onto one or two buses because they don't know when the next one will arrive. And outside of rush hour, especially after 7 p.m. for those who are either commuting home from work or heading to work, the service is even more unreliable. And the lack of dependable service isn't limited to the buses themselves. One of the bus arrival signs at one of the stops at a major intersection on this route has been out of service for two years. And it's been a year since I've reported it to the TTC to be, um, be repaired. This is a widespread problem citywide and the CBC reported on this last August. The neglect is also prevalent when it comes to pedestrian safety or the lack thereof in different areas of the city. So I've been in two different areas around this time while it's been constructed, two different LRT lines, I should say. And during the construction of the Finch LRT at Finch Avenue West and Keel Street, the majority of the time it was very difficult to cross the street safety, safely. The crosswalk was in complete disarray with stacks of construction materials everywhere and sidewalks were severely muddied and no way to discern where to cross in order to avoid oncoming traffic. This was in total contrast to another part of the city where I used to work in, Young and Eglinton, where there was always a crossing guard present during the day, there were barriers for pedestrians and clear signage for drivers. I could go on about other issues that greatly affect our day-to-day -day lives, such as the lack of teeth that Rent Safe TO has when it comes to enforcement and other areas that need to be considered due to our rapidly changing society and environment, which includes um, thinking about maximum temperatures for units in apartment buildings. But what most of the problems I've experienced as a resident have in common with the have in common with these things are is the amount of bureaucracy that one has to navigate in order to know when and how someone can make a complaint and the lack of enforcement of city bylaws. And there are some days where I feel like the potentials there is potential for the city, but more often than not, especially in the past two years, when it comes to planning for the future, I feel like so many people are excluded in the process and in turn are being left behind. There are many concerns um, that I've brought to the appropriate areas such as via 311 or my counselor's office. At most, responses have been lukewarm to these pressing issues and they affect the enrichment of residents' lives. It comes across that when, they when there's a lack of response of what, they what we have to say in these issues, that what we have to say doesn't matter and by extension, our area doesn't matter. But we do matter and we deserve better. As a concerned citizen, I understand that there are many issues that council has to grapple with and contend with, especially for this year's budget. And I implore you not just to think about just this year and in the short term, but to think about the long term and how this budget will have effects on the residents of this city for years to come. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much um, uh, for, uh, that was very thorough. Are there any questions for the deputy? Okay. I just have, if, I just wanna ask one myself, cause I'm, I'm wondering if we have a communications challenge and it's not getting out there. Um, 
In terms of the, the need for investment in transit, particularly in that area, um, the, uh, the, 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 the service add-ons that are in the transit budget for this year, largely made possible by the Provincial New Deal, they actually are multi-year. There's a multi-year commitment to, to help us with that. So it's not just no fare increase, it's no fare increase, but, but service added. And, and where we will see it is in the bus network, uh, you know, vehicles allowing, they're working to make sure they have the vehicles. But I'm wondering, is that widely known? Um, I don't think it's widely known. I think in general, when it comes to city services and what residents think they can or can't access, there is a communications challenge. Yeah. Um, I spent four years in university, the English degrees, learning how to parse that information, but some people do not have the time to spend on this, and it needs yeah. to be clear it can't be just pure jargon. Yes, it can't be jargon, absolutely. Okay, All right. thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to... When all this engaging is done, I'm going to suggest some real hardcore uh, communication without jargon. Thanks, Jessica, very much. It's Rena Sangupta here. Yes. Um, Rena, I'm just going to call out the names while you're getting uh, settled in there. Um, after this will come uh, Helen Armstrong, and then Zahavi uh, Zineberg, and then Sharon, Sharon Bider or, or Beter. Uh, so, Rena, if you want to go ahead, that just so those folks are ready after you, you have five minutes. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all. My name is Rena Shengupta. I am a resident in Ward 13. I came to Canada six years ago. I am asking that you support women, especially seniors and the nonprofits who help people in our situation. Nonprofits organizations provide us space for bonding, shared interest, and identity. I would like to thank the budget committee for launching a budget document online. The goal of the budget 24 is very important. It says to get the city back on track to a financially stable and sustainable future. That sustainable future will be possible if we believe in and practice inclusiveness, which will include all ages, including me. On November 9, 2023, 55 women in the downtown East York took part in a focus group for the city budget through the neighborhood group community services. The objective was to determine what women in this downtown East group want to see in the budget 22-4 of city. I will now share our focus group findings for your kind considerations. Affordability and housing. Lack of affordability of food, housing, and transportation is an issue for all 55 women in the focus group. The price for everything has increased, making it difficult for women to maintain their livelihood properly. Some women are very worried about their children's health. They urge the city to build more affordable housing rather than condos and to better maintain city-run housing. They mentioned to create more co-op housing and reduce waiting time. TTC issue. Participants had mixed experience with TTC services, though some are very happy with the recent more frequent TTC service. They are still concerned about safety on board, high fare, less washroom facility at different subway stations, the use of drugs and alcohol by some of TTC patrons was mentioned as a cause of violence in TTC vehicles. The participant requested the city to put more money into more police monitoring and proper actions. Safety, mental health, and addictions Participants worried about their safety in neighborhood due to the lack of control over drug use. They talked about substance use 
and addiction that lead to mental health problem also. Therefore, the city should allocate more services for the people with addiction and mental health. Islamophobic aggression was is discussed as a safety concern of Muslim women, leading to violence and threat. There was a strong call for the city to create a campaign to combat Islamophobia and racism. Engagement with the budget process. Some women felt they did not know much about the city budget process and had very little opportunity to engage. They want city government to hold community meetings and events before finalizing the budget. In conclusion, our urge is support immigrant women by extending your help as proposed. Provide nonprofit organization with funding for more culturally appropriate PR support work to immigrant women. PR workers can effectively address extreme social isolation and mental health concern, sign of women abuse, elder abuse, and can focus on healthy family relationship. And the last one, training for PR workers in our community to help to form community safety networks and in turn liaise with police and mental health first responders. It will help us stay independent, volunteering more, and less often meet hospital emergency. Thank you very much for your patience hearing. Thank you very much. Um, are, there, are there any questions for the deputant? I just have, have one. Uh, I'm wondering if you're uh, able to uh, share with us your, your deputation in writing. Did, did you submit it or, or you just have it with you to read? I prepared for myself. If you can ask me, I can hand over this paper. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you, if you could, if you wanted to email it to, to okay, I can do BUC at toronto.ca because I would uh, uh, love for the local counselor in that ward to, uh, to know that this took place and, and your, your findings. I will do, I will do. I'll okay, do. wonderful. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I have uh, Helen Armstrong is next, then Zahavi, then Sharon. Uh, is Helen, Helen's here in person. Yes, there she is. Hadn't seen you before. Okay, half afternoon. You know how this works, five minutes. <laughs> Good afternoon, to see you. Good afternoon, counselors. I'm speaking on behalf of the neighborhood group, Community Services. I've worked there for 15 years as a community development worker. We are a large multi-service agency with 31 locations across the city. We have a range of services from conflict resolution, youth engagement, housing and homelessness supports, and more. The programming helps to build resilient communities and prevent crime, and it needs significant funding increases across the city. In particular, we want to ensure the city fully funds and expands youth lounges across Toronto, as these spaces increase positive community connections and youth who can welcome life's challenges. We're also committed to working towards citywide programming of youth employment funding with wraparound services. We look to the city to partner with us in this work. Regarding shelters and affordable housing, of course these are key priorities for many of our participants. While we're heartened to see your proposed increases in shelter and housing funding, we stress that the funding will still not address the escalating needs in these areas. The mayor's election promised to increase funding to tenant eviction prevention through the Federation of Metro Tenants Association needs to be capped. Also, the multi-residential acquisition program gets a much smaller increase than last year to purchase 60 homes compared to double that amount last year. The number needs to be increased to much more. Moving affordable rental housing from the private sector to the nonprofit sector by a land trust and keeping it there is smart policy. We appreciate the modest increases to rent subsidies, but stress that the city must invest much more in this area. 
The proposed increase to the eviction prevention in the community program will barely keep programs afloat at their current level while there's increasing demand. The rent bank also needs much more funding to keep up with demand. We have many people at our agency who need these services and stress that they must be given a higher increase across the city. We see firsthand the concerns a number of our low-income participants have with policing. We support their calls and those of other advocates to detask the police where appropriate and not give an increase to the police budget. In particular, we want to see the Toronto Community Crisis Service fully funded in 2024 to expand across the city. We also support the calls to include peer workers in these teams, as we know how valuable peer knowledge and presence can be. The Forces Own data reveals violent crime is down in Toronto, not up, as you may have heard. We need fewer police officers, not more. In a recent survey with 34 drop-in users at our agency, a number expressed concern that the police budget is too high. Some called for a budget reduction, and others asked that police be available when needed. Some expressed alarm at their continued experiences of police harassment. Participants in one youth program want to see the police budget decreased significantly and savings put into community programs and youth employment. We echo calls from our childcare partners for more childcare funding from the city. Childcares need more operating capital funding to enable the full expansion and rollout of $10 a day affordable childcare. Sadly, the draft budget here does not offer what is needed. And there is no expansion of childcare subsidies despite the subsidy waiting list hitting 14,000 people. Childcare centers can no longer rely on parent fees to maintain and enhance programming and look to the city to provide more funding. You've heard from Rita Gupta that Islamophobia is a serious concern for women in our East Side programs. A number of them experience violence and threats due to their visible Muslim identities. Some women report they faced Islamophobic aggression from strangers. There is a strong call from these women, which we back, to create a campaign to combat Islamophobia. In conclusion, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak. We applaud the city staff for offering to invest $152 million to enhance services, more than in the previous decade in Toronto. We're also heartened to see a real property tax increase proposed. However, we encourage you to tackle the massive police budget and invest these savings in community programs, childcare, housing, and shelters. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Helen. Are there any questions for the deputy? Seeing none, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I have Zahavi uh, Zinerberg, or Zinerberg, hi. Now tell me if I was mispronouncing your name. <laughs> Don't worry, no, nobody, nobody butchers it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> uh, I, I, having uh, spent the first part of my life with the last name Baskerville, I'm, I'm sensitive to mispronouncing or making jokes about names. So I was hoping to get it right. Uh, Double Z okay. is usually my branding anyway. <laughs> so, um, okay, so you have five minutes to speak and then there might be questions. You. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you to Chair uh, Councillor Carroll, to the committee members and councillors here, and to uh, Mayor Chow uh, for providing us the opportunity to speak today to this year's budget proposal. My name is Zahavi Zinoberg. I am speaking today on behalf of the Centre for Israel and Jewish Affairs, commonly known as CJA. CJA is the advocacy agent of Jewish Federations of Canada, including UJA Federation of Greater Toronto, the largest Jewish community organization in the country. CJO strives to reflect the broadest perspective within the Jewish community, representing the views of more than 150,000 Jewish Canadians. The current surge in anti-Semitism poses, poses a grave concern for our community in Canada, and more specifically here in Toronto. This alarming trend reflects a broader increase in societal hate, which has reached unpre unprecedented levels in the last four months. 
Recent statistics from the Toronto Police Service reveal that in 2023, the Jewish community was the target of 37% of reported hate crimes, despite comprising less than 4% of the city's overall population. The significant rise from the previous year underscores the urgency of the situation, and even more so because so many hate crimes are not even reported in the first place. Jewish residents now grapple with the distressing reality of feeling unsafe in their own neighborhoods and hesitant to send their children to school. Synagogue walls are defaced with hate messages and symbols, while Jewish-owned businesses face targeted hate and boycott messages, escalating to the extreme act of arson just one month ago. Jewish individuals experience harassment and assault in various public settings, and surveys show that these lead almost 50% of Jews to downplay their Jewish identity in public. It is unacceptable to have to conceal who you are because of fear in our city, one that sees itself as welcoming, diverse, and inclusive. Jewish communal gatherings now occur behind locked doors with heightened security measures, emphasizing the increasing vulnerability of the Jewish community. There is a deep disappointment within the Jewish community that given the safety challenges it faces, that council would consider any reductions to the police budget. Adequate funding for the police is indispensable to protect the safety of all Torontonians, and especially so, in combating hate crimes against targeted minority <coughs> groups. Chief Demcu's leadership and partnership has been critical in safeguarding our city from the growing threat of hate-motivated crime since October 7th, underscoring the need for Toronto Police to have the necessary resources required. While Toronto Police have responded to these new demands with strength and patrols and mobile command centres, both of which have made a dramatic difference in ensuring community safety and security, the pressure that this puts on their budget can't be denied. And they've responded to over 300 protests varying in size and intensity under significantly volatile circumstances. In conclusion, the safety of Toronto, Torontonians cannot be shortchanged, and I urge this committee not to cut corners on our security. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of the deputy? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Perks. Thank you, and, and thank you for coming and speaking up about this. The council takes this very, very seriously. Um, did I hear you correctly when you said that you heard that council was cutting the police budget? Uh, they are not meeting the uh, requested budget by the Toronto So you're Council's aware that the proposal presently uh, would be a significant increase, and that's not even including uh, any wage increase for the police? So our conversations with uh, the police chief and the police board, they mentioned that uh, $12 million that they're not receiving. Oh, oh, I know they've asked for a lot more than, than inflation, but I'm just letting you know, just, just for your own peace of mind, that in fact, the staff proposed budget, uh, even if you just take an inflationary wage increase, the, the overall police increase would be the largest in over a decade and well above inflation. Um, a while ago, Mayor Chow announced, <clears throat> excuse me, a $10 million special fund uh, to provide additional security around hate crimes. Have you noticed any change in because of that investment that Mayor Chow made? Sorry. Uh, yeah, we've been, uh, you know, something that we welcome, but obviously the, um, the increased, uh, Situation. So you welcome that is, increase, yeah, you know. that special fund. Okay, thank you very much for your deputation today. Okay, thank you. So I just want to be clear, I, I just have a question of my own. Uh, 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 Mr. Zinerberg, I just have a question of my own. So I, I just, I, I'm wondering if anything is being done in the community to make sure that people aren't confused that the police budget is being cut. Because it 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 seemed to be confusing people all this past weekend. Uh, I heard from a number of people, please don't cut the police budget. In fact, a $10 million draw on the special events reserve fund was made available uh, by the mayor and city manager so that Chief MQ could respond to, uh, to the, the uptick in hate crimes. Um, the 200 officers that was approved in last year's budget actually needed training, but hit the ground 
it, it, what we heard from the chief last week was November, so 200 new officers in November, uh, facilitated by last year's budget. The classes to add uh, 200 more this year are already in situ, 147 and 120, so they're already on their way here, but faster than last year's. 136 civilians last year, allowing uh, faster response in 911, another 110 civilian, civilians asked for this year. And we're not saying no to any of those, and we're not in any way asking them to close the college. We're, we're telling them, replace your retirements. It's 200 net new last year, 200 net new this year, and at this rate, by the end of this political term, that could be 800 officers at this trajectory. Is the community aware of the efforts that the mayor and council are making to make those available? Yes, but in our in our com conversations with the police chief, he stressed that a twelve million dollar the twelve million dollars that isn't being allocated okay. puts a strenuous um, uh, it, it makes hiring uh, activity strenuous to respond to the increased um, demands of, of the of the situation. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so we'll we'll make every effort to make it clear to the community ourselves. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, Toronto 350, uh, Sharon Bider. Oh, yes, hi. Hi. And then if I could, while well, you're getting comfortable there, uh, Dua Hajazi, uh, Brooke Coatsworth, and David Cox are my next. I think one of those is a video uh, call. Uh, those are uh, queued up behind you. Go ahead, Sharon, you, you have five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, it's a, a privilege to be able to present to this council. Um, to, or to this committee. Um, my name is Sharon Bider, and I'm speaking today on behalf of Toronto 350, which is a volunteer-led local activist group focused on climate action, climate justice, Indigenous rights, and sovereignty. We're affiliated with other 350.org groups around the world, so we're part of a larger context. Toronto 350 applauds the efforts of city staff and this committee to make this year's budget process more collaborative, inclusive, and transparent. It really is a good feel to be presenting here today, so thank you. But we also note with great concern that recent town halls suggest that the city has failed to communicate to residents and businesses the significant impacts of climate change, including huge costs that will be borne by all of us in the form of property loss and substantial tax increases to repair damage from weather events that we face in the future. So addressing this gap in understanding really has to be a priority for this, for this city. Further, we don't see evidence that the 2024 Toronto budget, as it's currently cast, reflects the scale of spending required to meet the city's net zero by 2040 goals or the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty which the council endorsed in July 2021. We expect this committee to request from staff a detailed accounting of the funding against commitments that were made in the Transform TO Net Zero strategy to ensure that these critical initiatives are delivered on time. I participated in a very excellent consultation process, so we don't want to lose that. Um, we hope that this budget will reflect your commitment to an equitable and green post-pandemic recovery. We're still in the recovery mode. And in this context, we ask the city to consider the following for immediate action. First, enhance public transit. The city should ensure full funding of initiatives to enhance public transit throughout this city, including the Scarborough Busway, which is a big opportunity. And we heard from another deputant that Finch Avenue desperately needs better transportation as well. Support and promote green energy for heating and cooling buildings. This being our largest source of emissions, 30% of the emissions of the city are due to heating and cooling. And we rely on natural gas for most of this power. This budget must fund resources for aggressive promotion, planning and implementation of electrification and wind and solar energy sources. And it must fund drafting city building code amendments to set a timeline for eliminating natural gas heating. Third, 
We need to increase funding for low emissions, affordable, <coughs> excuse me, housing development, including non-market rental housing, with a focus on increasing densification near conveniently accessible transit. So we're asking for increased investments in the rent bank and the EPIC programs and the multi-unit residential acquisition program in order to prevent loss of affordable housing units. Fourth, we're looking, we're asking that you fund the energy retrofit program at a rate that is better than the business as planned scenario and provide funds for staffing to implement the emissions performance standards so that you can meet the council adopted interim targets for net zero by 2040. This has to be done while protecting tenants from above guideline rent increases and rent evictions. So it's a challenge. Fifth and finally, we applaud the city's move to establish a carbon budget that will integrate climate targets from the city's climate action plan into the financial budget budgeting process. And we urge you to proceed in all haste on this initiative. Concerning revenue, Toronto 350 endorses the 10.5% revenue increase proposed, and we strongly support the city working with other levels of government to establish revenue from a percentage of income tax or a municipal sales tax as a future revenue tool. We expect that this would be done with the appropriate protections for those with low income. Because this net next decade is critical in keeping the world a habitable place for both current and future generations, we ask that you consider our action requests and be a leader in climate justice-focused budgeting. Thank you for your time and consideration. That was pretty well-timed. <laughs> uh, yeah, Councillor Sachs, you had some questions? Yes, uh, thank you, Sharon, and thank you for the work that 350 does here and around the world. Um, you asked for hundreds of millions of dollars of, of, of investments, yeah. which would be wonderful if we had an income tax or a sales tax, which as you know, Doug Ford will not let us do. Given our actual financial reality, what's the single most uh, fast, cheapest, transformative thing you think we could do on climate? Ooh, that's a tough question for me. I knew you'd ask me one of those. Um, I'd like to make sure we answer that responsibly. My instinct is to say electrification is, is within reach because we do have the opportunity to move forward with it. Um, but we, I, I need to get back to you on. on okay, what do it fast. Budget days, uh, committee wraps up on Friday. Okay, will do. Thank you very much. Well, Councillor Sachs has made me need to ask a question. Sharon, I just had one other question. Does Toronto 350 advocate for these needs to the, to the other orders of government? Uh, yes, we do. Um, we actually have letter writing um, uh, campaigns that involve, uh, and currently there are, um, there are regulations that are in play that are being pre pre prepared at the federal level. And of course, okay. we advocate strongly at the provincial level as well. So yes, we do. And, and we, we, we recognize that the city is a, is a bit of a bit player in yeah. the larger issue. So we really want your advocacy on behalf of the city as much as anything else. Well, I will just, I'll remind my colleague that what the premier said was on the, on the idea of that generous revenue tool was not now, not never. So uh, if you could help us to keep the pressure up, we could meet those net zero goals for the city and help them meet their goals too. If, because uh, we're the best implementers and de deliverers of this stuff, we, we just need the resources to do it. So advocating for us to have a mature source of revenue that is uh, attached to the economy would be, be uh, a great help. Thanks. I think you can count on it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, is Dua Hajazi here? In person? Oh, in person. Okay. Hi. Do I have to turn this on? Uh, yes, but it, it should already be on. There you go. And you, you have five minutes to speak. Okay. Hi, my name is Dua. It's really difficult to share this and put the spotlight on myself because of everything I've been through. Uh, but since I moved to Toronto 10 years ago, I've struggled to access stable housing, at times being homeless myself. Uh, repeatedly struggling to access and find housing can scar your mental health, and I still carry those scars. 
I've seen so many stories of struggle all around me, as today I volunteer as a peer outreach worker to support others who are currently in that struggle, and I wanna share a story I've seen happen repeatedly. My buddy got out of the carceral system onto the streets with a criminal record for time served. Multiple times I've seen people being dropped off at an encampment site directly from police custody. My buddy had no real housing options or job opportunities. Weeks and months go by in homelessness. He can't sleep without self-medicating. Over time, he suffers injuries from living outside. With no appropriate shelter, he builds his own, and the city tears it down time and time again. He can't even leave his tent to run an errand without losing everything he owns. He came out of prison sober and only started using to cope with the trauma of homelessness and his recent experience in the carceral system. In survival mode, unable to afford his drug of choice that gives him rest and relief, he now contemplates suicide or committing another crime to get locked up and get off the streets and have a roof over his head. How does this keep him or any of us safe? Using city resources and policing to criminalize or hide homelessness is a waste of resources and doesn't make anyone safer. We see the criminalization of poverty and the harassment of poor people every day through encampment evictions, through trespass notices, given against people desperately trying to stay warm by accessing public spaces like parks, libraries, subway stations. The greatest threat to the safety of most Torontonians is being just one missed paycheck away from losing their housing. The housing crisis is not inevitable or an accident. It's the direct result of profits being put before people. Our city has to step up for its residents and do what it takes to really ensure stability and safety for all of us. We need to intervene in the financialization of housing and ensure people are put before profits. We need to make huge investments in expanding and improving public housing and rent geared to income housing programs. Until we achieve that, we need to ensure that we at least have enough space in our shelters, which are currently at 99% capacity even by the city's measures. Um, this means also to stop closing sh shelter hotel programs uh, and to make these programs a, a true pathway to housing. In this moment, we can't even ensure we have indoor spaces for people, so we need to stop punishing and criminalizing people who choose to live outside. Uh, that means an end to the city's current tactic of snatching people's tents and everything they own when they step away and instead enacting a moratorium on housing, on encampment evictions. My apologies. So that's it for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing that to us. Uh, are there any questions of the deputy? Seeing none, thank you very much. Okay, so I have Brooke uh, Coatsworth and David Cox. Uh, Brooke is online uh, while you're uh, uh, getting uh, getting them uh, uh, hooked up and unmuted. After that, we'll come back here to David Cox, Zach Bradley from Kensington Land Trust, and, and Joy Connolly. Uh, Brooke, are you online and unmuted? I am online, yes. Fantastic. Okay, we can hear you. You can go ahead, and you have five minutes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Chow and Toronto City Councillors, thank you for your time today. I'm a resident of Ward 14. I'm concerned about the city's new budget plan under Mayor Chow to increase spending and increase taxes far beyond inflation when there are valuable, marketable city assets sitting and costing residents. These assets I'm speaking about are Toronto community housing properties. From my backyard, I can currently see two vacant TCHC properties that are in a location where comparable homes are selling well north of a million dollars. One of these homes, which has new private multi-unit developments on either side of it, has been sitting collecting dust for about five years. Uh, the other home was a meth then until about three years ago and has been sitting vacant ever since. Mayor Chow touted over 2,000 homes in the TCHC portfolio that she plans to develop. Why don't you just sell these vacant homes and the thousands like them across the city that need a lot of work and money to maintain and use the money generated to put towards newer, denser, affordable housing projects. While the real incomes of average Canadians are going down, those living off the fruits of those hardworking taxpayers, taxpaying citizens are living it up big time. For example, the new Toronto Community Crisis Service coin, reimagining Toronto's mental health response, a test pilot project costing taxpayers potentially $13 million a year to expand 
this pilot, which has been built on, from what I gather, the Gerstein Crisis Center's leadership and organizational model. Reviews of this model are mixed. Here are a few examples on the negative that I've seen and read online. The crisis worker I spoke to had no real referrals, resources, or ideas or solutions. Just going to the hospital was all they wanted me to do. Another, she would, wouldn't stop interrupting me or talking over me. The crisis worker I spoke to was man mansplaining me. It felt like he needed to win the conversation. As a whole, I have a problem with the amount of investment going into harm reduction services in our city that are pushed by individuals looking to capitalize on ideological battles that are actually dividing our city and our country. Science-based research is always touted, but often not explored by politicians and their researchers. Please take your time investing in these programs, reviewing these programs, and look where they're coming from. Ask the tough questions and engage communities that they're going to be operating in effectively. My concerns have led to three questions I'd like to present to the Budget Committee to be considered. How will you ensure this tax hike does not negatively impact the local economy? My family and many others will no longer be eating out or buying local which is often more expensive than, than buying from Amazon or big box stores, because with this tax hike, we will have lost disposable income to do so. Another question is around seniors. My parents is who I'm thinking about now at risk of losing their home that they've lived in for decades because of the Olivia Chow tax hike, which is double inflation. Are you asking them to move outside the city, away from their families, from their grandchildren in order to survive month to month? And finally, how much of this tax hike is gonna to go towards pay raises for city staff and councillors, or what is the average percentage pay hike budgeted for the city staff in the upcoming fiscal year? Just a few questions that I have I wanted to add to the list. Thank you very much, Chairman Chow and fellow uh, councillors for your time today. Um, that's all that I wanted to say, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Um, I found this uh, Councillor Chow actually isn't sitting in on the meeting, uh, Mayor Chow, I should say, isn't sitting on, on the meeting today. But I, I understand she is going to be reviewing the location she's not attending because we have simultaneous meetings. Uh, she will be having a look at later, so I'll, I'll highlight that for her. Are there any questions for the deputy? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, David Cox is next to say hi. And uh, while you're getting comfortable there, I have Zach Bradley next, Joy Connolly, and then we'll go back to video for, for Phil Rule. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, five minutes. Okay, well, first, as usual, my thanks to the committee for allowing me to uh, speak at today's hearings. Uh, I'd like to open the remarks with the plea that we stop treating budget cuts as a taboo subject. It seems like as soon as we get near that topic, Everything gets, everybody gets very nervous. Uh, the mayor tells us we have a budget crisis. Homeowners are asked to pay 10.5% more in property tax. Don't argue with that. And yet only a handful of the city's operations groups and agencies have reduced their gross expenditures and even fewer have reduced their net expenditures according to the document that you publish as an attachment. Now, in fact, quite the opposite. There's one community and social services group called Social Development Finance and Administration that's had a net increase of 28%. 28%. On what grounds has this uh, increase been uh, justified? It's yet to be made public. And all I can hope is that the executive director of this group doesn't write another book. And I'll let you think about that one. Technology services gets an increase of 17%, despite being unable to prevent the library system from being hacked. And it's still taking them months to get it back on stream. And the library services itself, which hasn't been able to provide a full service offering for the past three months, gets a 10% increase. These aren't the actions of a city that has a crisis. I mean, it's obvious to anybody out there. Let's talk about city management. City management is accountable for the policies and programs delivered by members of the Toronto Public Service. And yet, not a single indicator appearing on the city's dashboard measures, uh, dashboard measures either efficiency or productivity. It just mentions activity, 
This is how much more got pushed through. We don't know what the unit cost is. We don't know whether this was an efficiently done item or not. It's not there. And how can you run an operation without this data? The answer is you can't. And in addition, the ability to learn from other cities is no longer available since the city has withdrawn from the municipal benchmarking network of Canada, which was probably the only and is still the only uh, document and organization that allows people to compare how well are we doing in all the services we provide. And lastly, a comment about today's session, which I know you aren't going to like, but I'm going to make it as well anyway. And this relates also to the budget consultations held in November. I went to one of them. The public shouldn't be fooled. Both forums are staged to make it appear that the views of citizens are truly sought. When we were asked to prioritize the city services funding at the meeting at the Rexdale Community Hub, the results of prior sessions were already on display. It's like voting when you know the rest, how the rest of the country has voted. This wasn't an objective question, it was a loaded question. Little time was given to questions, because I was at the one with Shelley Carroll. We had a nice uh, budgeting 101. We had a fill in the form, and uh, I think there was about half an hour, if that, for questions. Even if some new practical suggestions are presented, everyone on city staff knows that the likelihood of them being incorporated into the budget committee wrap-up by January the 26th is virtually nil. Today, like every other budget committee hearing I've been to, most of the people here are asking for more money for their interest group, or at least not to have a cut. We could have all this submitted in writing. You know, two-page document from each group that's lobbying for money for their particular organizations, send it into you, have a deadline, let the, let the councillors or the committee review it. This is a much more efficient way than us all trooping in here and giving the same old verbiage year after year and bring, wheel out the young child to make the case, get four people in to stack it up the numbers. This is just a staged event, Shirley. And I'm sorry, I just think it needs to be made clear to people. That's my 10 cents worth. Are there any questions of the deputant? I just, I just have one. Why are you here? Uh, <laughs> I'm here so that enough people get to hear about yeah. how do you manage a city. Um, I just want to, I just want to make one uh, uh, question. I, I'm very troubled that you, uh, you mentioned a, a division with an increase and, and said that it was hidden and there was no way to find out what the increase is. So I'm wondering if your local councillor or 3011 or whomever, has walked you through how to look up city budget 2024, go to that division, go to the operating budget, and underneath it, key cost drivers that will tell you exactly what the, the increase or decrease, because there are 600 million worth of efficiencies I, I, I in here, have but they are that. actually spelled out. Okay. And I wonder if your local council or anyone has walked you through how to find that information. Well, it'd be interesting if at the same time, you folk would publish data that was consistent with the, the reference points I wrote in about, you've got uh, some groups, uh, when they show a surplus, it's a negative. Another group, when it's a surplus, it doesn't have brackets in it. I refer to a document I sent you. You obviously haven't read it. Uh, we've got people like uh, Waste and Water who are generating revenue surpluses. They appear yes. in the same category as everybody else, but all the, all the bookkeeping terms for those two groups are different. If they're going to be different, so, put so, them in a different category. So if we, I, I, so so it sounds like no one has explained those various things, the brackets for revenue generating, net revenue generating divisions, and and so on and so forth. It uh, granted, it is a, a a challenging format because it is so, it is so okay. diverse let, let, in its delivery. Let but me it, ask you then, is what there, is the difference between a surplus with court services and a surplus in waste management? 
One of them is fee-based and the other is tax-based. I'll come explain Yes, it yes, then we put we, them in those categories so that people, when yes. they read the budget, can see. Instead, you blend everything in. And the tactic here is confuse the public. They won't dare ask any questions. So uh, we would love to eliminate your confusion, but I, I hope that what you could go away with is for a thing like solid waste that generates a revenue, as it will tell you in the notes if you read through them, their surpluses go straight into a stabilization reserve so that they can function without debt, likewise water. For court services, those revenues actually come back to the city to help balance the budget. Those, are, those various uh, uh, changes for profit-making uh, divisions are in the notes, but I think we need to do a better job of making those notes available to Not you. Not the notes, it's the way you display the data. There are two different categories. You've told it, you've explained to the audience here, there are two different categories. Then show them as two different categories. Don't show them as item 15 and item 17 in the list of services. Plus, I went online and the, num the numbers that were published for one of the services had been changed since it was originally published and no reference was made to the change. Well, I'd be happy to, to clarify some of that for you. If we it's in my note to you, uh, Chair. I'm also. gonna dig that note out then. I'd Absolutely. be happy to and I'll go through it in, in great detail. Because I tell you, if, if, Thank if you. it can't be made easy, then you're just giving people a job. Well, I'll do my level best to take a look at your letter, and if it can help us to improve on this format, I promise you, you'll see it next year. Uh, we do win awards for transparency. Thank you. Let's see, I have uh, Zach Bradley next, Joe Conley, and then we're going back out for uh, virtual. Uh, okay, Mr. Bradley. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. To get started there. Okay, five minutes. All right. Uh, hi, councillors. Thanks for uh, hosting this and having this long conversation. Um, my name is Zach Bradley. I'm the development manager with the Kensington Market Community Land Trust. Um, I'm here today to talk about the multi-unit residential acquisition program, lovingly known as MURA. Um, before diving into that, just to make sure everyone knows who we are, uh, the Kensington Market Community Land Trust is a community-led a nonprofit organization. We seek to take property off the for-profit market and return it to community benefit. Um, we're a part of a growing movement that looks to provide community-led solutions to housing affordability and anti-gentrification and displacement of our small businesses all across Canada. Uh, our focus is in or near Kensington Market. We currently own and manage 12 uh, affordable residential units and we have five commercial spaces. We acquired these uh, units in 2021 after a lengthy battle between the existing tenants of this building and their prior landlord. Um, after tenant organizing, we were able to secure Section 37 funding from our councillor and acquire the building. Since 2021, we've been able to own and manage this building and it's been a success. We currently fund half the building through a mortgage and then the other half is done through the city funding. This was pre mira so this was done when Section 37 was still, ex still existed and something that we do miss. Um, looking forward now, we we've done this successfully and we know it's a solution. We have people all across North America, both from Mer uh, US and Canada, reaching out to us asking what we're doing, what's our model, what's our solutions. And we want to expand and we want to keep growing. However, we can't find a way right now to fund any future sites. The only solution that we see is doing is through Mira. So the multi-unit residential acquisition program is, comes out once a year. They provide $200,000 per unit from the city of Toronto. And we think this is one of the greatest programs that exists. However, we think it's severely underfunded. Right now, Kensington Market's in a terrible need of our service. All across the city, we see housing being lost, affordable rental housing being lost. There's plenty of stats out there with varying accounts of for every construction, new unit you're constructing, you're losing plenty more in the process to rent evictions, to displacement, to short-term rentals, to demolition, to various other means. So when we talk so much about focusing on the construction of new affordable housing, it's very, very important, but we cannot talk about that without also talking about the preservation of existing. If not, we're just digging ourselves deeper and deeper into a hole. We've been trying and lobbying to the Ontario government as well as to the federal government to create funding acquisition uh, or to create funding for housing acquisition. Right now, the federal government and the uh, provincial government do not have any programs for this. 
CMHC has funding for new a new construction, but there's nothing for the acquisition. So as a nonprofit in Toronto, our only source of funding right now is Mira. Mira comes out once a year. So it'll be coming out hopefully in March this year. The budget for 2024, according to the Housing Secretariat, is 11.5 million. That's about 60 units. 2023 and 2022, they did 120 and 140 units. When we're talking about a housing affordability crisis, the Housing Secretariat has decided to reduce it by half. That doesn't seem like a solution to me. So I'm here today to say that we don't have any other options, that we're, we're a grassroots organization that's providing affordable housing and we're doing it every day. We're a staple of what can be done, but we need funding assistance. When I look at Mira today, I'm, I'm saddened to see what's happening. Housing acquisition is the fastest way to provide affordable housing. It's the most sustainable and it's the most cost efficient. I think that the city needs to re-examine and understand what Mira can be. I think we should look at what the mayor uh, promised and her commitment in 2023 for 100 million in Mira funding. And I think it's possible. The city received a housing accelerator fund of $471 million with a part of it being going, going towards housing acquisitions. I believe in 2024, in, we can augment the existing 11.5 million that's shown in the housing secretary budget to create a $100 million fund using the 471 million from the um, housing accelerator fund. Um, 100 million dollars in Mira would result in about 500 to 600 units. Mira funds about $200,000 per unit. It sounds like a lot of money because it's a lot of money. Our housing market is a lot of money, but if you want to build new housing right now, you're looking at 450, 500 to 600,000 per unit. So in terms of that, it's still a very good deal. So with my time running up, I wanted to let you guys know that we're, we're ready as an organization. We want to buy more, we want to preserve more, we want to do this. We have partners, we have people on the ground, we have strong community support, we just need the funding. So we really need Mira funding to be strong for next year, and I know the city has the capability, so I encourage you guys to push for it. Thank you. Okay, I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of covering for for uh, my vice chair, Councillor Perks, in this. If he was here, um, he'd probably ask you uh, um, what you understand. But there is a there is a challenge with Mira in that um, an acquisition for a building came out of it just before the the uh, the, the budget was drafted. But, and then the, the latest tranche for, for the, the increase from the Housing Accelerator Fund came after these notes were developed. So where monies are going to be going, we, we asked for in a briefing note last week. So by the time we're giving our final advice, January 26, we'll have before us a, a, a sort of a truing up of, of what, what can be contributed to Mura. But the basic 10 million a year is still going in, but if you pull out an acquisition at the wrong time, it, it can look like we're just depleting the fund. Um, but I, I understand that briefing note will go public uh, this week, probably uh, Wednesday, Thursday at the latest, so that by the time we're doing the final budget, um, you'll know, but I'm gonna make sure uh, Councillor Perks uh, knows about your deputation. Um, it, meaningful, not just as a budget committee member, but as chair of planning and housing and a, and a Mura agitator, <laughs> shall, we put, shall we put it. Has, has the housing community had that discussion directly with the, the, the trusts, et cetera, yours in Parkdale, had that conversation with housing secretariat directly yet? No, we've heard nothing. Okay, so we'll make sure that that information is getting you, particularly through the land trust, because that, that's, that's such a, a productive and essential part of the grapevine. So we'll make sure that the information is reaching you that way. Okay, um, and I think that's it. I think there are no other questions. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, Joy Connolly next, yes. Hi, how are you? Okay, you know you know the drill. You know it's five minutes. <laughs> Actually, you've been here when we reduced it to three. It's five whole minutes. <laughs> I came with a three and a five minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am Joy Connolly. Um, I'm a longtime housing advocate. I'll also just say, given the context, um, I'm also a uh, homeowner and senior and taxpayer. And I have to say. I want to start by thanking the mayor and you, the budget committee, for having the guts to propose and, uh, and a uh, uh, budget 
that invests and protects in the things that we value and depend on from our city, from our home. So I'm not here to propose either cuts or additions to this budget, but I do want to alert you and all members of City Council to an upcoming opportunity and an upcoming challenge that could affect how our tax dollars are distributed. So the opportunity is the Federal Housing Accelerator Fund. And I understood that uh, this funding is not already embedded in the city's budget, but when it comes, I hope you will invest a significant portion in Mura, <laughs> the program that sadly was trimmed back to a measly 60 units per year. I don't need to recap everything you just heard. Exactly right. Here's the upcoming challenge. Over the past couple of years, Toronto was caught off guard by an unanticipated wave of refugees. Many of those refugees landed in our shelters, in church basements, or on our streets. I believe that we are about to see a new wave of homelessness from an unexpected source. Tenants who now live in multi-tenant houses. For many years, MTHs have been the only intrinsical affordable housing for single newcomers, seniors, students, low-wage earners, and people on social assistance. So in 2022, City Council made a brave move by legalizing MTHs across the city, but it also placed a six-room cap on MTHs in Scarborough, North York, and Etobicoke. I don't think many rooming house operators are aware of this cap, but once the penny drops, I believe we will begin to see these houses sold off or turned into Chi-Chi apartments at $3,000 and up, simply because the house can no longer generate a profit with fewer than six rented rooms. And the tenants who are displaced will be entering a market where $500 per month rooms are a thing of the past at the very time when other MTHs are also closing down and they will end up homeless. When it comes to public investment in legalizing multi-tenant houses, I see $25.9 million uh, uh, a year for MLS building and fire inspectors, largely starting in 2025, and zero new dollars, zero, to ensure MTH tenants don't end, end up sleeping in the nearest park. So what can we do? We could boost our 2025 budget to increase shelter spaces even more at a monthly cost of around $5,000 or and up per bed. That's the expensive route and defeats the entire point of legalizing multi-tenant houses, which was to improve tenant safety and living conditions. Plan B, we can significantly expand the rent subsidies and housing benefits we rely on to prevent people from becoming homeless and help people exit homelessness. That's an option that's better for tenants and less expensive for the city, but it's not one that I see already embedded in this budget. Or <clears throat> plan C, we can eliminate the six-room cap. That costs the city nothing. That doesn't mean there won't ever be displacements, there, but there will be fewer of them, and it won't be because their home doesn't meet some arbitrary cap. So, if you're looking for solutions to both prevent homelessness and prevent the further loss of the city's deeply affordable housing that won't break the budget, I say vote for Plan C and invest a sizable portion of the Housing Accelerator funding into Mura, two solutions that will save Toronto money, not cost you. Thank you. So, uh, Joy, I, I'm going to uh, ask Councillor Perks to ask you some questions so that he can use you as a proxy for Zach, who had to go, <laughs> so we can get that information out there. Go ahead, Councillor Perks. So, uh, thank, you, thank you for your advice on this, Joy, and, and all the advice you've given me over the years. It's been incredibly helpful, uh, and I look forward to still more. Um, so, the housing accelerator piece that you were talking mm -hmm. about, so I want to be really clear. You think an appropriate use of that would be in in those instances where we've got a multi-tenant home, uh, the owner doesn't want to make the investments, whatever we purchase. Is that? Doesn't have to be a multi-tenant home in general. In general. Th th this is the deal. The most affordable housing Client is the, the one that's already built. Yes. That's right. Okay. So to stretch your money. Yep. That's where I would put it. 
Are you familiar with uh, the province of British Columbia recently introducing its own acquisition fund? No, I'm not. Yeah, it might be worth looking up. Look at this, I'm giving you advice. Okay. Do you think other orders of government, the federal and provincial government, uh, should match at least the amounts that the city is putting into acquisition of the least expensive way to keep people from being homeless, which is acquiring already built low rent units. Won't get any argument from me. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much, Joy. <laughs> Perhaps you want to also ask her if she was aware that, that while these books were already done, there's every intention to use some housing accelerator funds to May, fortify I'll, Europe. I'll ask it in my own words. <laughs> were you aware that uh, the uh, recent announcement of the housing accelerator uh, was not included in this budget because it came after the documents had been finalized? I haven't seen anything post-revelation of the budget. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Joy. Okay, take care. Okay, uh, we have a video uh, uh, deputation from Phil Rule, and then I have Nathan Gomes, uh, Wanda Fabrici, and uh, James Grace. I hope I'm not wrecking those names, but uh, Phil, I can get correct every time. Phil Rule is uh, online, I think. No, no, oh, he's not connected yet. Okay. So I'll leave that and we'll go back. Is, I, is Nathan Gomes online? Because I don't see him here. Oh, okay. And uh, and then Wanda, uh, Wanda, Wanda for for Breezy or for Bricey? Oh, she is online. Wanda, are you connected? I think you need to unmute. Uh, we, see, we see it's indicated that you are connected. Okay. Oh, Can there you are. Like there that? you are. Welcome, Wanda. Um, we just need, uh, we need you to, to uh, remember five minutes. It should show that on your screen. You can go ahead. Thank you very much. So I wanted to say that I'm supporting my previous speaker, which was Brooke and David. So I already had to correct my notes because I'm not going to say whatever they already said. I don't want to waste uh, your time and everybody else's time. And uh, uh, sorry, that was my phone. Uh, what I wanted to say, my husband and me, we are seniors. So I, I will be talking from point of view of seniors. Uh, we are unfortunately still working uh, just to pay our bills and uh, put food on the table. And... Uh, I think the, 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 the tax increases are really in the possible worst time for us. Uh, we are all in the financial mess, um, the, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, uh, the war in Middle East, and we cannot really afford this tax hike. It's like uh, un unbelievable. I'm in uh, the immigrant. I came to Canada in 1991. I never saw, and I, I live in Toronto all my time. I never saw taxes like that. Uh, so my question to the city is, if I have to live on my budget, why city cannot? Like we have to look for the creative solution to find some savings. And uh, definitely I found some, uh, I will share with you guys and then uh, we will see what you have to say about it. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that agree to this window clearing it's winter right now, and I think this cloud will be doing terrible, terrible job with this window, <coughs> window cleaning. Uh, my husband, which are seniors, and me, we're going after them and try to fix it, what they, what they, uh, they do not right. Uh, I would even go further, and 13 years ago, I wrote the emails to... Um, at that time, uh, it was uh, Rob Ford and to my consular, Michael Thompson, about the side, sidewalk clearing. This is really done very badly. And uh, we always have to clean anyway. <coughs> when the plow goes on the sidewalk, they just compact the snow. So we have ice. We have ice and then it's very difficult to walk on it. And you can see whoever clean the residents, if they clean, it's much better than whatever the city did. 
uh, I can see that my time is uh, still half, so I will go further with my other um, solution for the city. On my street and on other streets which I walk, you can see the park uh, cars for hours, more than three hours for sure, during the day and sometimes even whole nights. If city can send the, uh, the officers to ticket these cars, th th this is the savings. This is really like a income for the city. Um, and then I, I'm shocked regarding the buses because somebody was uh, complaining about buses um, that they are not not up, up to their uh, expectation. Um, I live close to the Kennedy and uh, 401 intersection. And now we have one lane of Kennedy taken by buses, painted in red, so nobody can use it. The traffic jams are terrible. Everybody is doing the shortcut through my, my street, uh, which is a residential street, 30, 30 kilometers per hour. They going like 60 most of the times. And then these buses are running empty. If I see one or three people, that, that's, that's, that's empty in my opinion. So, so this is such a waste of money. I think somebody should check <coughs> and do some analysis when these buses should run so they are full of the pe people not running empty. Uh, the other thing which I notice, uh, the street renaming uh, issue, this is such a waste of money. Like uh, why we have to rename the street and waste million of dollars of it? And the, uh, the other thing, um, Mayor Chow, she was proposing to uh, to er erase the, the the budget for library. My daughters, they told me that nobody uses libraries anymore. Everybody is in the computer and internet. And then library, uh, they, they, they even get hacked. So like, this is really, really not working. I think we should really introduce the user fees for the uh, city services. So people, they would really appreciate the, the services the city is uh, uh, giving to them. And uh, I, I have uh, one more thing uh, that uh, seniors and uh, low income um, uh, people cannot really afford these taxes. And maybe they should be done by the income tax instead of the, by, by the house, which maybe we have to lose. So unfortunately, uh, yeah, my I'm going to have to get you passed. to wrap up now. So I'm wrapping up. I didn't say everything, but, but I said what I wanted to say. Okay. Thank you very much, Wanda. Are there any questions of the deputy? See, there are no questions, Wanda. So thank you so much for your deputation. Oops. Okay. Um, I have uh, James Grace next. Ah, here we are. And while James is coming up, uh, after James, I will go to uh, back to, to online. I have Mohammed Rashid after that, uh, Isinta McDonald, and uh, Dan Eng. James, um, you have five minutes. Go okay, ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Madam Chair, Councillors, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is James Grace. I am here representing my fellow residents who reside on Oriel Parkway in Toronto Midtown. Thank you. I was on the, on the thing with the city. I just finished. Sorry. Uh, we, we need to disconnect just once. Sorry. I, let me pause your time. Uh, we just, I'm sorry. We, we've heard the deputation and we're that we don't have any more questions. So you can <clears throat> listen to the meeting, but you must mute. Oh, she's off. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. There you go. Thank you. I know that you have a very difficult job trying to decide how to spend the taxpayers' money to service all the needs we have in the city. I know that you're trying to find savings within the existing budget and divert funds to other needs. That's the reason I'm here today. There is a potential, there's a project being scheduled for our street that if halted could potentially save the city millions of badly needed dollars. I have filed a petition with your committee and which was signed by 78% of the dwellings on the street. And I'm not sure if you received that or not. Uh, well, we, we generally get yeah. all the petitions okay. set at wrap-up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll continue then. Let me explain. Okay. Oriel Parkway between Chaplin and Eglinton Avenue currently has a median separating the east and west sides with occasional raised planters. 
There is a scheduled project to resurface this minor arterial roadway, which we all agree is badly, repairs are, are definitely needed. My efforts deal with the extras. The project also includes tearing up the current drive over median and replacing it with a new curved median supporting greenery and trees. This curved median would also impair emergency vehicle access, increase congestion, and reduce available street parking. As a retired CPA with over 30 years experience in construction, including infrastructure and road, I am confident that the replacement of this median will be two to three million dollars. Briefly, this construction will involve tearing up 0.6 kilometers of existing concrete median and subsoil, produce and install new barrier curb medians, corner sidewalk bump outs, install new subsoil plants and trees. We know that our local councillor Josh Matlow has approximately $450,000 from Section 37 for discretionary capital funding dating back to uh, 2014. This appears on a line item in the January 2021 Transportation Services Program, but it does not detail where the extra funds will come from. In seeking to understand, we filed two freedom of information requests, which came back stating that there are no estimates for this project. So there's at least two to three million dollars that appears to be buried somewhere in this, somewhere in the budget that for a project that the residents don't want. What we, the residents of Oreo Parkway want is for the city to repair and maintain what we have Nothing more. By canceling this project, not only will the city save capital outlay, but it will also save the increased ongoing annual landscaping maintenance costs. I'm sorry if this issue seems so local and small compared to many of the others who will come before you to file their briefs, but I'm compelled to be here because there is no alternative. Despite many, many attempts over the past 17 months, Mr. Matlow won't speak to myself and my neighbors about this unnecessary and very costly project. He's refused to accept our petition and since last June has not responded to requests from our local ratepayers association about it and our collective requests for a public meeting. In closing, let me say, it is wrong that democracy is not working in this situation and I should not have to come here to be heard by city leaders. It is wrong that the true cost of the project is not transparent and easily accessible to the public. And more importantly, it is wrong that the funds for this unnecessary project that the vast majority of the residents on the street do not want is being spent where they are not where they are most needed. Just think how much $2 million could be used to help homeless and those in need in social services. Our city is faced with unprecedented challenges that require all of us to find ways to make living here more affordable and sustainable. As citizens and taxpayers, we have an obligation to find ways of doing that. Thank you for allowing me to be heard. No problem. <clears throat> Pardon me, I, I took a, a gulp of water while you were speaking and something you said made it go down wrong. <laughs> oh. Um, so the petition that uh, Matthew tells me it is attached to our materials, so I'll have a look at that. Oh, oh, you had I, I took that sign language wrong, so we don't actually have the copies of it yet. Well, I gave one to your office oh, on okay. Friday, and then when I was communicating with the budget administration, they asked me to send it in so it would be available to you. Um, right, that was done on Friday too because we can attach them as items of communication. If it's in my office, I'll, I'll have to move a motion eventually. <clears throat> you you, me, have, so a, you have a hard copy. The, yeah, the committee I'll, has. but I'll review it. Making it a matter of public record was what I was okay. trying to get at, but it will we'll resolve that one way or the yep. other. Um, so this would be a capital uh, project well, with capital Section $37. For, for the um, tearing and um, replacing yeah. the median operational for the increased ongoing maintenance costs on the median. Right, And right. To, to tell you the truth, in the past, I've been there 21 years, and I think I've seen maintenance crews out there two times, both in the past year and a half. 
And is this the, this is the trunk. This is it's the, which street is this? This is Oriole Parkway. This is the one that's on Oriole Parkway, not the one that's there's a, a skinnier median that car trucks sometimes park on over on uh, um, Upper Young Boulevard. But you're talking about the oh, Oriole no, Parkway. No, Oriole Parkway, south of Eglinton, north of Chaplin Crescent. Yes. Okay. So uh, um, I'll review the uh, the information and and uh, you know if we uh, if we can address this with the local councillor um, in time for budget. But you probably if there's an outcome to your deputation, um, because there'll be all of that to be to be dealt with, you won't see a motion in our January 26th uh, budget committee agenda. But we'll highlight and make recommendations. Yep. Uh, uh, to the mayor that she look into it. Yeah, we're just uh, so looking when for it becomes her budget, if there's something to address here and save some money, we certainly would love to do that. Yeah, we're just looking for some transparency and some community involvement. And uh, yes, so there hasn't has there never been a consultation on it. There previously? was a meeting, a Zoom meeting in June of 2022 that was attended by a handful of residents. Okay. And it wasn't well publicized. Yeah. And I know this is going back almost 10 years, yeah. um, but there's been, there hasn't been a meeting where we have all the, all the residents together. Okay, um, so, so I'll follow up. Um, uh, thank you very much for bringing it to our attention. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, and our next is a video deputation from Mohammed Rashid. Oh, he's not connected yet, so we'll wait and see. Jacinta McDonald. Hi. And then uh, while you're coming over, uh, after that we have Dan Eng, uh, Piotr Sepsky, Holger Butcher, and Ingrid Bidet. Okay. Hi. Hi. Okay, uh, you have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Hi everyone, thank you for, so much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Jacinta McDonnell. I live with my son in Ward 9 Davenport, where Alejandra Bravo, Councillor Alejandra Bravo is our elected city representative. I'm with the Plant-Based Treaty Global Team and Toronto 350, two groups that are members of the Toronto Climate Action Network. The Plant-Based Treaty is a global, grassroots campaign to transition our food system from animal-based to plant-based to help mitigate a climate catastrophe. As a homeowner, I will gladly pay approximately a dollar a day more in property taxes to improve the quality of life, safety, access to transit, and fund much needed housing and shelter programs, as well as supporting our climate initiatives. According to the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration National Centers for Environmental Information, 2023 was the hottest year on record, and 2024 could even be hotter. I support an increase to greening our city by planting more trees this year rather than cutbacks. I personally felt the relief from the heat that a green space and trees provide as I walked to the Dufferin Mall on a hot summer's day last year. The temperature dropped noticeably as I walked along Croatia Street at the north end of Brockton Stadium, where there is a soccer field and a row of trees. These green spaces offer other benefits, including places for families to gather for outdoor sports, and they are good for our mental health. Food is the largest source of emissions in Toronto's community-wide consumption-based inventory. The City of Toronto can take action on food procurement to easily be closer to meeting our targets as a C40 city and the Transform TO net zero strategy. If our child care centers, long-term care homes and shelters were to adapt plant-based menus or default veg menus, there would be significant savings for the city budget. For example, the University of Guelph Early Learning Lab School is plant-based and has seen a 10% savings and an increase in meeting nutrition standards for the children. In long-term care homes, they found that plant-based staples are more cost-effective than animal-based foods. 
The Humane Society International Plant-Based Substitutions Guide highlights total cost savings between substitutions, like saving $1.42 per 100 grams by replacing tuna with chickpeas. The findings for childcare centers and long-term care homes would also benefit city shelters. Along with the financial benefits, there are environmental gains and health benefits due to a plant-based diet. I respect all that the city has accomplished so far in setting up Transform TO and responding to the climate emergency by approving the net zero by 2040 plan in 2021. In order to meet our goals, we need a transit system that is once again admired around the world. Fully funding the Scarborough Busway needs to be a part of this year's budget. I would like to thank Budget Chair Shelley Carroll and everyone on the Budget Committee. All of your hard work, probably during the holiday season, is much appreciated. The budget consultations and town halls have been informative. Many thanks to Mayor Olivia Chow and the city councillors who hosted one. I will be watching the voting process on the city budget. Um, uh, quite, well, yeah, some mind, more, some mind more than others. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you so much. Just thank you so much. Uh, okay, uh, Dan Eng, is that an uh, in-person deputation? Is that an online deputation? Okay, we don't see him yet. Um, is this Peter Sepsky or? Oh, here he is. You're gonna have to tell me how to pronounce your name. Well, at first time it was good. Yeah, like and, and, ah. and now you changed to English. So I do use yeah. the O. Well, at first time it was Piotr, and that was amazing. Then, okay, yeah, and okay, I'm thank going you very back much. to it. Thank you very much. <laughs> you bet. So uh, you have five minutes, welcome. Thank you. Uh, hello everybody. Uh, in the 2024 budget, I'd like to see investment in accessible public transit, Vision Zero, shelters, and affordable housing. I'm confident that a substantial portion of the money to pay for these priorities is in the budget that we already have. One place to look for savings is in the City of Toronto's fleet of vehicles. Savings can be found by making sure that the right size of vehicle is procured for the duties required. This would also help the city meet its transform to your goals. According to data from Toronto Green Fleet Report from 2023, the city operates 10,000 motor vehicles. This fleet produces 40% of the city's carbon emission. Right sizing of this fleet needs to happen if Toronto is to achieve net zero carbon emission by 2040. Because of the budget pressures, we should move even faster with transforming this fleet. One city operated vehicle that should be right sized is the Ford Explorer SUV used by Toronto police, TTC constables and fire department. Ford's official Canadian website puts the cost of one Ford Explorer hybrid SUV at around $55,000 before tax. This is a premium, large, and inefficient car that burns 11 liters of fuel for every 100 kilometers. This is unsustainable. Vehicles that are better in every possible way are currently available at lower prices. Ford itself offers a middle-class category hybrid SUV. It is called Ford Escape, and it starts at $35,000. That's a $20,000 difference. A few of these models are already being used by Toronto Parking Enforcement and 311. This car burns, burns five liters of fuel instead of 11 liters to travel 100 kilometers. Half the fuel consumption half the air pollution, half the cost. Rise sizing needs to happen to all vehicles the city operates. There is no need for a Toronto Parks worker to drive a large F-150 truck to open a park bathroom. In the face of budget limitations, climate emergency, Toronto gridlock and Vision Zero, I am asking the city to right size its fleet and use the cost savings to support public transit Vision Zero initiatives 
shelters and affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for that. Um, I'll just see if there are any questions of you. Uh, don't see any, but I really want to thank you for your deputation because you, you highlight that we have to be ever vigilant. You, you even named divisions that downsized and then re-upsized. So thank you for yeah, reminding me. Thank you. Me. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, so I have uh, Holger Butcher, then Ingrid Bidet, then Elisa Gale. Uh, is uh, is a Holger here? No. Nope. Don't see him. Um, well, Ingrid is coming. If you, if you want to start getting ready, I'll just check. Did Phil Rule show up or Nathan Gome show up online? Okay. Nordan, okay, Ingrid, we're, we're jumping down to you. Pardon? <laughs> no problem. We, we, uh, there's a couple of people who didn't show up, so we, we definitely, we can manage it. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Okay. Excellent. Go ahead. Well, it's a pleasure to be here again, and thank you so much, Councillor Carroll, for making sure that the public has a chance to voice their opinion on where the city should spend our money. And thank you, councillors, for your time and for listening. So, surprise, I'm going to be talking about noise. I am the founder of No More Noise Toronto. I founded this group over one and a half years ago after I learned that I'm not the only one who's experiencing significant health issues due to noise. I've created a data-centered approach around understanding noise we live with by measuring sound from people's homes. Um, I've done that for over two years and collecting crowdsourced not 311 noise reports to fill the gaps that exist in the 311 reporting process. And we're making an impact. In advance of the ECDC meeting, over 500 emails were sent and we had over 40 deputations on January 11th. So why is reducing noise important? It is the number two urban environmental health hazard. In 2017, Toronto Public Health published How Loud is Too Loud. Almost 93% of residents are exposed at night to noise over the World Health Organization's guidelines of 45 decibels. 54% are exposed to noise decibels, noise above 55 decibels during the day. And this has health impacts. Some of these are heart disease, heart failure, diabetes, high blood pressure, annoyance and sleep disturbance cause these and many other health issues such as depression, anxiety and impair learning in children and loss of concentration and focus for adults. According to Professor Tor Oyamo, 230 premature mortalities annually occur due to ischemic heart disease and 20,000 quality years of life are lost annually due to noise disturbance. This problem has gotten worse in the last four years and it will likely replace air pollution as the number one urban environmental health hazard. So we wanna be a partner with the city. Last week at ECDC, committee members, you guys heard a lot about vehicle vanity noise. So let's talk about long-term sustainable enforcement. And I have a solution for amplified sound from roadside establishments with area sound level monitoring. So I think you need to invest in noise cameras. We have to, we need to automate moving vehicle noise enforcement without increasing the police budget. New York City had a pilot for two years while they sorted out the legislation. They have purchased 25 more cameras, so we have over 30. The tech works, the tickets hold up in court, and they make their money back. Costs range from 6,000 to 30,000, depending on the manufacturers, and there's leasing and purchasing options. And you can click the image to the right of the web to view the webinar from the manufacturer of the New York noise cameras. So from the crowdsource data, um, my, my NOT311 noise report, almost all of the 9,000 reports are about moving vehicles, and 50% of those are reporting loud mufflers. Currently, the city cannot do anything for moving vehicle reports. And you can see the workflow for reporting moving vehicles complaints as it stands today. It simply does not work. So, from my week-long measurements, I have been able to estimate peak noise event exposures. With the help of Esri Canada, we performed a buffer analysis. And in 2021, over 665,000 people live within 750 meters of a highway. They suffer with over 42 noise spikes in 24 hours. And over 1.2 million people live within 100 meters of an arterial road. They have 142 noise spikes in 24 hours. Over 66% of Toronto residents are constantly assaulted by noise at all hours of the day. The city needs to invest in noise cameras so everyone can have a better sleep. I also, need to think, I also think we need to become a smarter city and invest in sound level monitoring. 
Noise occurs 24 hours a day. While more bylaw officers would help, we need process improvements to reduce tension and increase efficiencies. Area sound level monitoring, not audio, is possible. The sensors plug into the top of streetlights. The city already has licenses for this software and the cost is equipment and installation, $1,000 to $10,000. To the right is a video of the Netherlands on how they have used sound level monitoring in their cities. So there are a number of benefits with sound level monitoring. Real-time measurements displayed on bylaw officer screens for efficient and timely responses establishes a baseline measurement for sound levels in the city. There's no need to enter homes of people who have reported amplified sound from establishments after 11 p.m. And this helps to ensure the success of the night economy in existing and new areas for operators and residents alike. Sound needs to be managed at the street in the public space. And reducing noise supports all of these city programs and initiatives. So I recommend that the city implements a noise camera pilot program and a sound level monitoring program immediately. And this is all to create a better Toronto by reducing noise. Thank you. Okay, we will, uh, we will try. Are there any questions, <laughs> Councillor Sachs? Yeah, Ingrid, thank you again for another excellent presentation. And really, you do so much for the city with all your volunteer work. Um, what would this cost? That's a, and so I tried to get costing from the manufacturers that I'm in touch with, and they are very hesitant to, hesitant to supply that because it depends on the number, it depends on the manufacturer, there's a competitive bidding process. But really, sound level monitoring is quite inexpensive, inexpensive as I understand. So under 10,000 for one is what I'm estimating. Um, I so that's what I saw online. But the sound, the noise cameras. Um, there's a couple manufacturers that I'm in touch with. The SoundView ones are the more expensive ones that the New York City uses, and they run about 35,000 US dollars. Um, and then there's another manufacturer out of the US, and they're starting at 6,000. But again, that technology is, is not as, um, I don't wanna say it's not as proven, but it's just not as far along or hasn't been used as much as the SoundView cameras. Apparently, New York City makes their money back from the noise cameras that they use. That's where I was going. If you can get some information <laughs> from us showing that this pays its way, give it to me, I'll see what I can do. I thank you very much, I will do my best. Okay, uh, Councillor Royce, did you, did you wanna follow up? <laughs> Thanks you for coming in. I know we had this discussion already oh. at committee and I believe staff is actually gonna come back with the report I think at some point. They said they'll look into it, so. Yeah, I did have, so there were some questions regarding, um, you know, why the city might be hesitant. I did have that webinar on Thursday and there were city staff present. There was also some councillors, Councillor Ainsley attended, which was great. And we had uh, a quick discussion afterwards. So um, I'm all open for sharing information and to seeing what we can do. I understand that the province also needs to come alongside. So my understanding is that while New York City figured out the legislation, they did a pilot program because the legislation doesn't need to be changed for a pilot. So we could potentially do a pilot quickly while we figure out the other details. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And that I, I, I can save my questions for, for another day in economic development because it'll be coming I'll be in. there. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much, Ingrid. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so Holger never showed up? No Holger, no Dan A. Okay, so uh, who do I have remaining? Elisa Gale, Michael Rosenberg I know is here, Edna Norty and Nora Rahman. Uh, we finished uh, late before, we're gonna be able to catch up the time we robbed the clerk's office of <laughs> by <laughs> getting done a little ahead. Uh, Alyssa Gale, yeah, hi. You bet. And this opportunity to speak. My name is Elisa Gale, and I'm a member of Jews Say No to Genocide, Independent Jewish Voices, and United Jewish People's Order. I'm also a health worker in Toronto. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. And I do want to recognize that we're on the lands of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, Wendat, and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We, all of us, are on stolen lands, and we connect the struggles in our solidarity with all Indigenous people. I'm here echoing loudly the messages I think that we are all hearing recently, which is that we reject the myth that the police keep us safe. 
and amplify the voices from countless communities that the police cause harm. Today, I keep in heart and mind the families and loved ones of Sami Yatim, Edmund Yu, Regis Korchinski Paquette, and the many racialized people who've been killed by Toronto police. Not surprisingly, we are seeing the cops use a typical tire playbook, using fear to elicit support for their obscene budget and to justify their existence. They criminalize our neighbors, black, brown, indigenous people, unhoused folks, sex workers, people in emotional crisis, poor people, and people using safe injection sites. We say enough to racial profiling and surveillance and enough to using our tax dollars to fund state violence. We also say enough to Toronto Police's violence to silence dissent and criminalize pro-Palestinian peaceful rallies to protest the <coughs> ongoing Israeli genocide and ethnic cleansing in Gaza. I've been participating in the beautiful Palestinian-led demonstrations, and we all, including families with small children, walk past lines and lines and lines of militarized cops and cops on horses. They are not there to keep us safe. They are there to intimidate, surveil, and terrify people. In essence, they are trying to silence free speech. We've also witnessed egregious and obvious overreaches, including the shocking early morning raids of 11 lifelong peace workers who were simply postering, and the police brutality when they used a knee on the neck of a Palestinian solidarity protester on December 10th, 2023. These cops are not bad apples. This is who they are, and this is what our tax dollars are funding. They are upholding white supremacy, anti-Palestinian, anti-Arab racism, and anti-Muslim hate. And also let me say these police intimidation and violent tactics are not working because Palestinians and Jews and all people of conscience will continue to show up in the streets. The police are also weaponizing anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic hate crimes to yet another as another justification to increase the police budget. The use of accusations of anti-Semitism as a strategy to suppress condemnation of Israelis' apartheid and genocidal regime have been promoted by the Israeli government and organizations like B'nai B'rith and Sija for decades. B'nai B'rith and Sija claim to speak for all Jews as if we are a monolith community. And it was, it was deeply concerning to hear the Sija um, deputation earlier, the idea that the Center for Israeli and Jewish Affairs, that Israel has a voice at our deputations and pretending and claiming to represent all Jews is deeply offensive as a Jew. It is also deeply concerning that uh, they are claiming that we are all worried about going to school and to work and I live downtown, and I work up at Bayview and Lawrence, and I never experience any anti-Semitism um, and walk around quite safely. Um, the only fear that I do have experience, I have experienced is Zionist counter-protesters and cops at demonstrations. Two weeks ago, I was demonstrating, and a cop continuously rammed his bike into me, knocking me off balance over and over again. He and his fellow cops thought this was very funny. Um, and he even made an anti-Semitic comment. It was Palestinian, Arab, and fellow protesters who helped and supported me. Anti-Semitism is real and deeply concerning, but the weaponization and political exploitation of anti-Semitism is profoundly concerning, offensive, and the fear-mongering is tiresome. The deeply concerning hate crimes in our city are in fact the police violence against black, indigenous, unhoused, trans people, sex workers, mad community members, and Palestinian protesters. And I'm also not sure how letting people freeze on the streets of Toronto or allowing the overdose crisis to continue, why are those not called hate crimes? So we say enough. Community leaders and courageous folks who've been brutalized by Toronto police for years have been seeing this, and I'm hopeful the city will listen. Another Toronto is possible. We see examples of this all over the city in so many communities. We do our own care checks not violent criminalizing wellness checks, which terrify our friends, families, and neighbors. And we reject having decisions made about our communities or dictated by Sija or Bay Street. We need the city to fund our communities and care resources. We keep us safe. The police do not keep us safe, they do harm. And we do not want our tax dollars funding state violence. Defund, disarm, dismantle, and abolish.
Okay, thank you. Thank Are you. there any questions? Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So Lisa, um, I have Michael Rosenberg. Mr. Rosenberg, good afternoon. Okay, hello, um, I'm Michael Rosenberg. Um, so um, this year's process, you know, seem to be getting, a, in some ways, a little bit more transparent and more uh, um, interest in priorities. So, I mean, the tax increase has been more often than not a accurately described by the full percentage number rather than trying to hide part of it. That was helpful just from point of view of accurate accounting. Um, and there's been, finally, been some talk about priorities. Um, I think it takes a while for people to actually change their minds about priorities and actually have it have a real impact. But this year they did actually ask people what they thought was better and worse ways to spend money. And in the past, that question was studiously avoided. So, I mean, th those things were good, um, but I think it will take a while to actually um, let that sort of go through and affect decisions that are actually made. Um, I think we need to, to get to the specifics now, we, we need to really uh, apply that to technology. Um, a, a, about a couple of years ago, there was a, a uh, plan that was produced and I, I did speak to them and we got involved in the, the uh, um, advisory committee and um, we were able to get them to uh, consider and to include in the report the term avoiding harm. So it wasn't just a, a positive report about technology, it was actually um, something that could be built on to do a real technology assessment process. I think we're still a long way from viewing technology from an assessment point of view and it still seems to mostly come down to just whatever catchphrases happen to be attached to it. Um, I don't think that's gonna do in the long term. Um, you know, people are certainly starting to be aware that the technology of artificial intelligence is really a major thing and it's here. Um, but, it still seems like people are trying to avoid thinking of what the real consequences are. Um, the negative real consequences and the, the fact that it is actually a real danger is something that, you know, people from the early days of the computer industry predicted. And it's only in the last few decades that people decided to forget about that and only look at the positives. That was a big mistake, but this is the, the idea that there is something dangerous going to happen is not um, something to be disbelieved. It's what people have always known, and it should be taken seriously, and we should start looking at where we're going with this. And we don't always need to just listen to the immediate um, oh, we can do something with this technology. That doesn't take into account the fact that you're accelerating the future development of something that you will, will eventually not be able to do something with. So let's sort of take a second look at this. Let's do not just technology assessment, but a real future looking version of it. And try to set ourselves in the right direction, because when you're talking about priorities, that means what do we get out of this? Is it really something we want? And you have to look at the future to see that. So we might make different decisions if we were really doing um, a real priorities assessment. So we don't have to just keep doing things the way they were. We could decide that some things don't work and some things do work. And just to end with something that does work, 
I wish the TTC would actually buy more buses because the buses actually provide better service than surface rail. And I just wish they'd have more buses. And at, at the most you need is HOV lanes. You don't even really need any other surface infrastructure. And, and you, you know, sometimes the, the only time you get good service on some of the streetcar routes is when they have to shut them down and replace them by buses. So there, there's, there is often a very simple solution. There's the smaller vehicles mean you get them more frequently. Um, they can pass each other. They have lots of advantages. And sometimes there's just a simple solution like that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, that resonated. <laughs> Are there any questions for Michael? <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Michael. Okay. Okay. So we just have, uh, we have a couple more, and then I'm going to go back up over the list. Is there, there are some people who weren't uh, online at the beginning who may, may have turned up. Uh, so I have Edna Norty, and then I have Nora Rahman. We only waited for hours and hours. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Yes. I'll start your time. Here we go. So you have five minutes. Thank you. Hello, councillors and fellow Torontonians. My name is Edna Norte, newcomer co-lead for the Toronto Youth Cabinet. This afternoon, I want to draw your attention to a pressing issue impacting the well-being of newcomer youth in our diverse city. Our city not only provides world-class education and opportunities, but it also serves as a welcoming home for refugees and asylum seekers. Toronto's reputation as one of the world's most multicultural cities is a source of pride, yet the challenges faced by newcomer youth presses on. As someone who immigrated to Canada with my parents, I've experienced the first-hand issues that newcomers face in the city. This is something I want you all to understand. Education, housing, childcare, transit, employment, and the cost of food are all compounded by the newcomer experience. The ongoing funding dispute, particularly the $200 million that was allocated for sheltering newcomers last year, underscores the urgent need for increased support. Yet, it has been seen that only 35 million has seemed to be received, and it has created a substantial funding gap. The proposal for a 6% federal impact levy highlights the city's need, and hundreds being turned away from an overcrowded shelter system. Newcomer youth, who represent a significant portion of our population, find themselves caught in the crossfire of this funding dispute. These challenges stem from a complex array of issues, including federal immigration policies. The current federal support, although it is very, very much appreciated, falls short of meeting the escalating costs incurred by our city. As this year's budget proceeds unfold, I implore the committee to explore the long-term impacts of inadequate funding for newcomer youth and their quality of life. Increased funding is not only crucial for immediate housing needs, such as um, dormitories, hostels, things like that, but will contribute to the successful integration in them in our community. More effective and affordable education and providing them with quality employment opportunities. By investing in the well-being of newcomer youth, we directly invest in the future of our great city. It took hard work over many, many years for my parents to comfortably establish themselves in this country. And it is thanks to them and their resilience that I now feel like I have a future in this city. It is thanks to them that I have the opportunity to be speaking with you all today. And I have the opportunity to speak on behalf of newcomer youth. The political, social, and economic landscape is constantly shifting in our city. And we have to work fast to support the newcomer youth. Our newcomer working group at the Toronto Youth Cabinet is home to many newcomer youth from diverse experiences, backgrounds, and walks of life. But we all agree that there aren't nearly enough resources and supports available for newcomer youth. 
Things like the Toronto Fund Guide, the Toronto Public Library Systems, community centers, and newcomer kiosks are all contributing a large part to the supports, but we need more. It is the job of a city that prides itself in welcoming everyone to ensure that no one regrets coming here. But unfortunately, largely due to the funding for newcomer youth in this city, many people are starting to feel this way. It is with a budget like this year's that we can make a difference in the lives of Torontonians. I urge the committee to consider the issues of funding and support for newcomer youth. Increased funding, particularly in the areas of youth-specific programming, is paramount to addressing the immediate challenges. This is not an easy issue, and we are in some certain uncertain times. I acknowledge all that the city has already done in terms of programming, resources, and support, but we can always do more for our most vulnerable youth. Thank you so much for listening, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you for Stay coming. Stay right in. there, Edna. Uh, Councillor Royce. Thank you for coming in today and deputing. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a week today that uh, the mayor and Councillor Caroline went to Covenant House uh, to to just to go in and uh, meet the residents there and to see what programs they have in that facility. It's the largest youth shelter in the country, and I was just shocked to see that 90% of the youth that lives there were black, but more be more shocking, or it's equally as shocking, 55% were refugees. And also too, they, were, they turned people away every night, and so the city actually provided funding to Covenant House to add 40 cots in their gym. So my question to you um, is, again, this is part of the housing crisis we're in and you know the discussion we're having, but what role can other levels of government play in, in this? Like, how do we make that um, more visible, you know, and forward facing? Because to me, it is very troubling, and I'm going to say a crisis almost. Because I know, and again, I'm, I'll say it here again, like the way that I'm sure families and kids were treated in Ukraine when they came here versus how when they come from the continent of Africa is very different. And those kids, you know, end up in a shelter. In the, in, the, in the core of the city? I know it's a loaded question, but <laughs> you respond how you'd like. Um, <laughs> what I will say to that, though, is a lot of people have many different experiences when it comes to um, housing and shelter and things like that. But to be able to increase the issue to different levels of government to actually get it addressed, I think that is where we ourselves have to step in and be able to advocate, which is why I'm happy that I'm able to speak with you all. Knowing that shelters are turning people away, the disproportionate amounts of certain cultures and ethnicities found in these places is extremely concerning. And I don't understand why the issue is not being addressed at this point. Obviously, on my own part, there can be more research done to figure out what exactly is being done, but I do think advocating more and being able to go directly to these people and providing the opportunities for us as youth to go directly to these people would help bring the issue into the limelight. Would you in agree, be in agreement that the needs of a youth and the needs of an adult are different and should be treated accordingly? Yes, I do think youth sometimes amplifies issues that we face in life. And it is very different from when you are an adult, and which is why I'm calling for more funding towards youth-specific programming. As a young person in the city, my issues are not the same as that of my parents or somebody who is an adult on their own. And these are things that need to be taken into account when making policy. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morris. Councillor Perks has some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, before I ask you your, uh, my question, um, thank you so much for choosing Toronto. We've clearly benefited from having you and your family move here. Yes, thank you. Um, you mentioned during your deputation that you understood that the federal government has only given 35 million of the That's right. 95 million they promised oh, us. 200, 200 million, oh, excuse 35. me. Um, how did you come across that information? This information, when I was researching for my deputation, I saw from a variety of sources that were talking about the money that the federal government and our government were um, interacting to receive. Like media and other sources, is that? Yes. Yeah? I just wish that maybe perhaps some federal MPs from the city of Toronto were as diligent in their research as you are. <laughs> Thank you. 
I could maybe supply you with some email addresses and you could send them that information. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Are there any other questions? And uh, thank you so much. So You're much right. It is 35 million out of the total of 200 million promised thus far. <laughs> You're absolutely right. The 97 is not in the bank yet. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and next we have Nora. Yes, there she is, Nora Raman. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Great. Can. Great. Go ahead. Thank you, everyone, for holding out until the last deputation. Uh, hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Nora Rahman, and I'm also part of the TYC. Thank you, Edna, for that beautiful deputation. I serve as the Director of Council Relations. I'd like to start with a slightly personal story. I'm pursuing my, mas my bachelor's degree in peace, conflict, and justice at the Monk School of Global Affairs at U of T. However, before that, I went to high school at Western Collegiate Institute. Last year, I picked up my phone and I almost dropped it in shock. I read the headline, student 15 shot outside of Weston, and a chill went down my spine. In my mind, Weston meant the varsity basketball team and boring math classes, what a high school should be. I thought about all the people I cared about who went to that school and how I would feel if any of them were hurt. Forever when someone Googles Weston, they won't learn about how the football team won city finals or how a bright student won an MIT Harvard math competition. They'll see pages and pages of articles about this horrific school shooting, a term I never imagined I would have to use about a Canadian school, much less my own. Unfortunately, acts of violence are becoming increasingly common in Toronto schools, disproportionately perpetrated by and against our city's young people. In the 2022-2023 school year, the TDSB suspended 323 students for their involvement of acts of violence on school property. This does not include students suspended for any other reason. There are only seven criteria for violent incidences for the TDSB, possessing a weapon, physical assault requiring medical attention, sexual assault, robbery, using a weapon to harm or threaten, extortion, and hate or bias motivated occurrences. 323 students were suspended for these seven actions throughout September to April. I do not need to convince you that school violence is an issue because the daily news and countless articles online can easily do that for me. I wish to turn to the future and encourage the city to help stop these problems before they occur. Often, a young person committing violence is someone who cannot find meaningful employment or who faces housing insecurity and is unable to access the limited youth shelters in the city. Often, a young person committing violence is someone who has no place to go. So let's give them one. Currently, Toronto has 24 youth hubs, 22 enhanced youth spaces, and 16 regular youth spaces. This may sound like a lot, but only 30% of neighborhood improvement areas have youth hubs, only 39% have enhanced youth spaces, and only 24% have, have regular youth spaces. 12 neighborhood improvement areas have none of these spaces at all or spaces with irregular youth programming. We should have a youth hub or an enhanced youth space or better yet both in every neighborhood improvement area. These spaces give young people a place to develop, learn, have fun, and above all, feel safe. We know these spaces work. The TYC calls to create more youth hubs and enhanced youth spaces. I want to end my deputation by reminding everyone that the youth problems of today are Toronto's problems of tomorrow. In, 2000, in 2005, the city witnessed the summer of the gun, where 52 people were killed. Let's prevent the school year of the gun and invest wholeheartedly in creating meaningful opportunities and youth spaces accessible to every young person in the city. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Nora. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, just just have a, a couple of my own. I, I don't know if uh, if we've had this uh, conversation at youth cabinet. I don't know if uh, youth are aware that 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 the, the two things don't connect. How we fund youth spaces and the the whole neighborhood improvement area uh, program doesn't really match up because nine times out of ten. A youth space, a youth hub uh, in a recreation center or wherever comes out of development funds, and then we scramble to find the operating. And often, 
uh, one of the things that makes a neighborhood improvement area necessary to be designated that way is it's not an area with a lot of development in it. So sometimes we're developing a youth hub, but it's nowhere near this neighborhood of need. Have we had that conversation youth cabinet yet? I'm wondering if we should come and, and work on that one. Yeah, I think last time when you visited us, we discussed the need for these youth hubs in neighborhood improvement areas. I also read a report, I think dating to 2019, that said that the some of these youth hubs were intentionally tr like meant to be placed in NIAs or near them. Yeah. So that's sort of where that came from, yeah. But that's definitely a conversation that we should continue having. Yeah, it started out meaning to be that way and then got further and further away from it. The percentage, though, again, you guys did the research. We had not done the research and realized that, that that's how far apart we were. So I want to thank you for that. Of course, yeah. Uh, those are my questions, and, and, and we will meet again So because I want to come and keep working from you guys' research. <laughs> Look forward to chatting with you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Cabinet? Yes, yes, maybe the federal <laughs> cabinet needs to be the youth cabinet. <laughs> Good idea, Mr. Vice Chair. So, counselors, I'm going to go back through. Uh, we have we have some some um, you know deputations from early in the list that were virtual and hadn't arrived. So let me just go through those. Uh, we had Phil Rule registered, and he was going to give a virtual. I have Phil Rule. Uh, Nathan Gomes, who Nathan may have gone to Scarborough. I knowing I I know that constituent. Uh, Mohammed Rashid, uh, Dan Eng, and Holger Butcher. Okay, uh, I don't see those. Uh, so we uh, we're we're going to uh, oh we do have to adjourn. So we're going to receive these deputations. Councillor Moist, do you want to move the motion this time? Uh, Councillor Moist is going to move the uh, the, the uh, motion on the screen there. In teeny tiny font, this is a test. <laughs> okay, all in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Uh, so councillors, because you're getting this extra 30 minutes, I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but you're getting it back, which is why we all have to be here with bells on, because the list this evening is a long one. So we, we've got to be here six sharp. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you.